Well, thanks for being here with us. Um, I, I know you read the book and I don't know if you have any just initial impressions or thoughts or things on your mind that, that you're interested in um, talking about or we have some topics we can engage with you on. Sure, well, it was a fascinating book. The uh, biggest takeaway I had, which you could correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but is that uh, perception of uh, experience is, not, is, is based on a, a model of predicting uh, what we're going to uh, experience as opposed to uh, uh, constructed uh, directly from uh, perception. And uh, it's an interesting idea that intuitively makes sense that if you turn around and see my table, which is messy, that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm constructing a model of that as opposed to inputting all the, uh, all the data points. One, I guess, is that a, an, an accurate uh, summary of the, uh, one of the key Theses, uh, thesis of the book. Uh, I guess we could start there. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, that idea has been known by a few people for a long time. So that's not a, a completely new idea in the book. Um, but the idea that we have this uh, constructed reality. We, the, everything we see in the world is, is really built on this model we have in the head, yeah. which leads to all kinds of interesting problems for humanity. <laughs> At times, it's a useful thing too. But that, that is one of the key ideas. Uh, um, in the book, of uh, course, what, what the discoveries we made were how that model was built and how it actually comes about and how it's structured in the brain. But from a, from a point of view of a lay person, I think that is right. That's a great takeaway. You know, we have this constructed world model in our head and that's what we perceive, uh, whether it's right or wrong. Well, that, that's one of the things that interested me is the question of what it's wrong and this question of false beliefs, which is something, you know, in the political world, you know, whether it's uh, who won an election or vaccine efficacy or whatever it is. And, you know, did, did that resonate with you at all, Ro, on this question of false beliefs? And is, does it explain and does it help in any way in understanding how people form these uh, strongly felt false beliefs? Yeah, and I guess the question there is, um, where does philosophy come in and where does science come in, right? I mean, uh, so, you know, I, I mean, Immanuel Kant's famous theory is that we're, we're constrained just by the, uh, the perceptions of, of, our, of the human mind and can't know reality itself, like an animal could have a different perception. So I guess the question is, when you're talking about false, falsity and reality, where is that based on... Uh, the human mind's perception and, and, and how are you defining that? Because obviously that's a, such a deep question of what yeah. is true. Yeah, I think, I think it's, although I talk a lot about false beliefs in the book, I think, I think what you're talking about, Rose, that uh, what's false is can vary over time, or what we perceive as false can vary over time, what's reality can vary over time. Um, I make a point in the book talking about like flat earth, right? Flat earth is a really good model of the earth. It works really well. <laughs> but we could all use that. There's nothing wrong with it. We now think it's incorrect, really, right? Um, so there's what there's a situation where you have a belief structure which is quite useful, and we now know it's incorrect. And there's lots of things we know about the world which um, we think we know about the world, which are going to be limited by our experiences, as you said, right? We can't we can't know the full reality of the world. I think the uh, the thing that I'm hoping is that people can just accept or at least understand. Uh, the science behind this, like, well, why do we have different beliefs? Even if you and I don't agree on what's right, um, we can at least understand how we came about to have different beliefs. You know, how is it that two people can look at the same facts and come up with different belief structures about them? We, that would be a first, you know, thing that if everyone understood that, that would be useful. But I think this is a, a fundamental problem, especially when it comes to complex knowledge of things we can't all directly experience. And this is where this is where we have the most problems. If you and I experience something directly, we usually end up with the same model of it. Like you can touch it, I can touch it. You can see it, I can see it. You hear it, I hear it. But uh, the problem we run into is that in society, we don't all hear and see the same, the same thing. And uh, so that can really lead to different types of beliefs. Um, it strikes me that it happens all the time in things like economics, where you take a theory and you say, okay, a tax cut, does that you know, help the economy or does that hurt the economy? And that people end up with these very different frames of reference to interpret that, that uh, policy decision. I, yeah. And they may I, even look at the same results. I mean, look at the results of that. Uh, we do a tax cut and 10 years later, we say, oh, did it work? And some of those people say, no, it didn't work. See why? And some people say, oh, it did work. And see why? I think, I think the answer, Ro, is if we don't want to be... If, saying we know the right answer to these things. I think what we, the, the question is, 
it's, ed it's educating people about this process. And it could be quite detailed, the, the knowledge of how this works. Um, is that, would that lead to a more just or equitable or at least um, friendly societies? So what would be the, the, the policy recommendation if there are any in terms of the, 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 so the interesting insights that you draw about how we perceive things and why we may be perceiving things differently? Um, well, I don't, you know, gosh, you know, you're the policy person, not me, but um, I think, I think uh, you know, just to mention in the call to action, I mean, I have this belief, I have this desire that everyone should at least understand how they believe things, you know, what is the, what is going on in their head and why it is easy to have false beliefs or uh, the contrary beliefs. And so one policy thing is to make, you know, and I'm not even sure if we're ready for this yet, but it's to, to, uh, to make, just like we teach kids about DNA, right? That's right. Standard policy, right. We teach kids about the solar system. We teach kids about uh, the uh, evolution, at least with most kids. Um, you know, we ought to be teaching kids about brain theory. Uh, and yeah. about how beliefs are formed. You could wrap it and pair it with the sort of philosophical ideas that you've been bringing up. Um, but there's a real hard science to it too, right? Right. There's a, there's a real hard science. You know, we, we can talk about the, the implications of evolution, but you know, there's a science to DNA and how it replicates and you know, right. all that kind of stuff. So that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's the, my ultimate goal, people have often ask me, why do I do all this work? You know, how's it going to impact society? In addition to the work on AI, which we talked about a lot, I think probably the biggest thing I can say is that if everyone understood how they believe, how they understand the world, if, they, if it wasn't just as- And what would box, be the few takeaways you would want people to understand? Well, the first one is this, is you brought up, is this, this model, that you perceive this model in the world, right? That's the first one, um, that you actually don't directly perceive the world. And, um, and your model is, a, is by definition, going to be a subset of the world. It's going to be limited to what right. you can perceive. Um, it is not going to be a full reconstruction of the world. Um, and it's a best of an approximation. But just understanding that when we, even when we just look out the window and see a car, we are actually perceiving our model. We, there may be a right. car there, but, but it's your perception that another person on the part of the world might see something completely different. So. Um, so you, you know, this, this is the first thing is it's like we have this model and then, and how the model can be solved. And then, you know, if I would, then you can drill into the details of how the model is learned, how it's structured in your brain, um, you know, how, how your, your neurons actually do this stuff. Um, but, uh, and then this whole idea of how knowledge is stored in reference names is a big, big part of the model. It's, it's basically explains how we take information and structure it so we can act upon it. And two people can take the same information and put in different references right. and get two different belief structures out. Those are those are very high level concepts. You know, we're talking about something that you no know, one's ever done this before. I don't think brain theory is part of uh, everyday curriculum these days. So I propose to turn the conversation a little bit to AI since we're going to, um, you know, be limited on time. And I'm just curious, Ro, one of the things that uh, Jeff addresses in the book is, you know, is there, isn't there an existential threat for AI? Right. And, you know, you've been involved in thinking through regulatory issues and so on. And, you know, how did the book uh, help you in any way and think about that? Or did it give you other questions on this whole uh, topic of the threat of AI? And did you believe my arguments? You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess the question is, um, what, one of the things that we've been thinking about in, in, in Congress is that, uh, which, which it seems to be your model theory, would support is that there are more uh, efficient ways to um, construct AI than just massive data uh, processing, that uh, the human mind is more complex and that uh, we're at the very basic stage of understanding uh, how AI works because it shouldn't require massive uh, data input. Um, is that accurate or would you say well, that's, that's certainly accurate. That's one of the uh, differences between true intelligence and the, today's AI. That's certainly, uh, the question is why, you know, and so we try to address that in the book. You know, why, why does the brain does not require this massive data to learn things? But yes, it's a big, big criteria. The thesis of that the brain produce, perceives things through modeling, that our perceptions are imperfect, that you need embodiment uh, in, in motion to, uh, to, uh, understand how the human mind comprehends. Those ideas uh, are relatively 
uh, consensus. And then what you're saying that the unique insights on the physiology of the brain that allows- We figured out what's, what's unique is, is how this model in the brain is distributed in these cortical columns. There's 150,000 of them. That's novel. And how information is stored in those models using reference frames. That's new. Um, and those, those but the, like, but the, 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 so there's consensus though over the, I part. wouldn't say there's consensus. I, if I took the world of neuroscience and AI and I took Even over the part I said, the part you said, I said, would you agree with that? I would yeah. say maybe 20% of those people would say, would agree with that. Oh, even the modeling part is not consensus. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people have no idea about this. There's a lot of neuroscientists that don't know this. There's a lot of mm -hmm. AI people that don't know this. It's a very, very diverse field. I think 20% is a lot. It, it, sure. It, you know, it's, it, we're in this sort of pre-paradigm state where there are so many people have so many ideas. Um, but if you look at like a lot of the bulk of neuroscience work and the bulk of AI work, it has nothing to do with embodiment. The vast majority of nothing. And, and now you say, well, right. people say, does it make sense? And a lot of people say, yeah, that's right. I think that's right. Other people say, I don't think it's that important. Um, so we're, there's no consensus about this today. I think there will be consensus shortly. I mean, in, over the coming few years, um, but it's growing. Uh, but it, I wouldn't say it's consensus today. Not everyone would come up with just, we need to have an embodiment. I'm very conscious of the fact that Ro has another call he has to get to. Yeah, so um, I, I want to let you go if, if you need to go, Ro. I mean, we could go on on this stuff for- No, no, well, this has been fascinating. I, I, I appreciate it because I, you know, it's a hard, it's a, it's a very well-written book, but it's obviously hard concepts to, 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 to grasp right away. And uh, I think the more that, uh, people learn about it. I think it's, it's helpful. And I, to me, one of the takeaways is I think just a humility about how uh, imperfect our, our perceptions are. That was one of the things that I uh, took away from things and how much uh, we still have to learn about uh, AI, how far away we are.